Wedgeside Podcast is a proud member of the Wedgeside Media Collective. This week's episode is brought to you by the Wedgeside Media Collective. Due to overwhelming response from our vegan thank you totes, we've decided to extend all of our designs onto totes. So this month, you can get all of the totes for only seven dollars and fifty cents. Just use code Cleveland. Why code Cleveland? You ask. Well, because it's Labor Day, and President Cleveland was the one who first started Labor Day because he was concerned that the observance of Labor Day on May 1st would encourage Haymarket-style protests and would strengthen socialist and anarchist movements. <laughs> he, he, probably right, by the way. Yeah, it probably worked a little bit. Yeah, fuck him. So we're taking it back and using your name to sell our designs. To sell our anarchist designs. <laughs> so go to Witch Side Media Collective, witchsidecollective.org, and use code Cleveland to get all of our tote designs for only seven dollars and fifty cents. This is episode 200. Wow. We're yeah. in the big digits now. Holy crap. We're in the triple digits with a two. <laughs> triple digits with a two. <laughs> we just doubled our triple digits. Yeah, we did. Yeah, since it's a special episode, we're going to do another lecture series for you. This is a lecture from Mike Huskison, and it was recorded by the DIT Collective. And Mike is a longtime animal rights activist. And he talks about hunt sabotage and his experience with animal liberation activities. It was recorded at the Norwich Anarchist Book Fair. So I really hope you enjoy it. I want to give a special thanks to the DIT Collective for uh, providing us this lecture. Thank you so much. You can find them over at theblackplume.noblogs.org. Or just follow the link in the show notes because we'll have it there for you. Hey, Jordan, what news and mystery we have going on this week? Well, No New Animal Lab is on their European speaking tour, and that's September 2nd through the 21st. If you're going to be in New York, you should go to Burning Books and see Daniel McGowan on September 8th. On September 9th, there's a national prison strike, and on September 10th, there's a Salt Lake City Veg Fest, and we're going to be there, and you should check it out. Come say hi. Yeah, that's at Library Square, September 10th. So for the uh, slingshot this week, on September 11th, 1989, is when the San Francisco Department of Health finally issued Food Not Bombs a permit to operate a field kitchen to feed people. It's so nice of them. I know, like, because, you know, we have to get government permission to make sure people aren't hungry. Mm-hmm. Fucking hell. Not so- all cops are bad. <laughs> I sincerely hope you enjoy this episode. I'm kidding, by the way. sabotage, hunt saboteurs, and the very good action they do to protect our wildlife. And uh, you may have thought, well, what's he talking about? Talking about fox hunting, hare hunting, stag hunting, or whatever. It's all been banned. We don't need to worry about that. We're on earth the point of having someone in here talking about hunt sabotage. Because that was all last century, banned in 2004. Well, let me tell you, if you went out into the countryside in November, December, or if you were down on Exmoor now, you would not notice much difference at all. The hunting is continuing more or less as it always did. 
And uh, the only real difference is that the people that do it cannot celebrate their actions. They can't sort of put on their uh, magazines, oh, this is us having a wonderful gallop, and we did a five-mile point, and the fox went here, and the fox went there, and then he was dug out, and he was bolted and hunted again. They cannot celebrate their illegality, but it still goes on. And what happened after the ban was that the hunt saboteurs, league against cool sports monitors, and you know, all sorts of people thought, well, the police would enforce this. You know, they might not like it, but the police would uphold the law. Because the law is the law. And when, when I started as a hunt saboteur in 1971, the police said to me, look here, Sonny, don't do doing that. Don't be spoiling people's fun. If you don't like what they're doing, you get the law changed to ban it, and then we'll be on your side. That's what they told me in 1971. So I worked long and hard, and with others, we got a ban, but it doesn't amount to a damn thing. Because the police, far from being on our side to uphold the law, what we find is the police are going round to the hunts and saying, look, one of the ways around this law is that if you go out early in the morning and you film yourself laying a drag, then if anyone should accuse you of illegal hunting, you can show that you're actually just hunting an artificial scent because you've been laying a drag and you've filmed yourself doing it and that, that would be a good defence. So that will allow you to carry on and if anyone accuses you of illegal hunting, you'll be okay. We're in Norfolk now. I actually live in Suffolk and Suffolk police officer has said to me there will be no prosecutions for illegal hunting in Suffolk because he has had a word with all the hunts in Suffolk and the Suffolk, police, Suffolk hunts have told him, we only hunt legally, and that's it. We only hunt legally. So the police officer said to me, so if you get any film of them hunting illegally, that's an accident. And an accident is not illegal. Anyone can have an accident. So, you know, it's not going to happen. There will be no prosecution of any hunt in Suffolk for any illegal hunting. It won't happen. No matter what they do, it will always be an accident. Therefore, what we have is that two or three times in a week, you're going to have the hunts going out, and they'll be putting the hands across the fields of Norfolk and Suffolk, and anything that gets up is liable to be chased, and hunted and killed. And therefore, we need hunt saboteurs now as much as we ever needed them. One of the differences, of course, though, is that because what the hunts are doing is illegal, the saboteurs themselves have a bit of a defence because I was interfering, intervening to try and stop a crime taking place. And that introduces an interesting dimension that gives the police some problems to how to deal with that. Now you may think, well, okay, so instead they're talking about interfering, intervening to save an animal's life, well, how do you do that? How can one, two, three, or four people stop a big mob of hunters on horseback with lads on foot and people in cars? How can two or three individuals stop all that number of people from killing a fox or a hare? How can it be done? Well, of course, it can be done the way it always has been done. Because for a hunt to work, they have to have a link between the huntsman his hounds and the quarry. The hounds are the essential thing and we can break the link between the huntsman and the hounds. We can intervene to force a gap between the two and we do that with a hunting horn because we can mimic the huntsman's own horn. And just as they blow the horn to control the hounds, to encourage them, to stop them, to exert all manner of control over their hounds with the horn, so can we. They use their voices. They shout to the hounds, talk to the hounds all the time. And we can mimic that. We can interfere with that. We can use whatever they use to control their hounds, we can use to stop the hounds as well. So the way it works with local hunt saboteurs 
is that we always give the hunts the benefit of the doubt. Whichever hunt it is, we're happy to give them the benefit of the doubt. And go out there and say, okay, you say you're hunting legally, you say you're only hunting a drag, fine, we'll watch you, we'll see you, and see if you do. And if they go out and, you know, you can, you can train hounds to hunt any scent you like. They could easily hunt legally. They could have someone running a trail around and the hounds would follow, and if they come away from that trail, the huntsman would stop its hounds, put them back onto the artificial scent, the humane scent, and everyone would be happy. Everyone would have a ride, everyone would have a lot of fun without any animal suffering. But that doesn't often happen. And what we find is that if they might set off doing that, but as soon as they put up a fox or hare and it goes off, and the hounds will then chase that hare, chase the fox, and it's whoop, 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 whoop. Ah, after the live quarry. And at that point, they have broken the law because they've encouraged the hounds to hunt illegally. And then we can intervene. And uh, we will then take steps to protect the live quarry. And um, we have many opportunities to do that. You know, because you can blow a hunting horn from quite some distance away and you will pull the hounds away. When they're chasing live quarry, it's not like a sort of a straight rush. After a hare, a hare will go in circles, big old circles, and she'll come back to where she started from. And she'll normally do one big circle, and she's fine. She's put fit, tough hare. will run the circle easily. That gives us plenty of opportunities. When the hounds check, when they're a little bit hesitant about where to go, we can call them on. Whoa, 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 whoa. Come, you know, and then, yeah, so they just want to, they just want to hunt something. So they'll come to us. And then, of course, they've gone away from the real hair, and they come to us, and they come to nothing. And uh, you've saved that hair's life. If she does a, goes off on a second circuit, she's starting to tire then. And uh, you normally find that they will do two full circuits of hair, and then she's really tired. And if those hands are locked onto her for the second circuit, she's got problems. Because a hair, you know, it's not like a fox. A fox will go to ground and hide in, the, in an earth. Other animals might have got trees. A hare can do neither. She'll live or die on the open fields. And uh, when she's done two circuits, she's starting to get real tired. And she starts to panic then. And then she'll go in a straight line. And uh, then you really have to be smart to intervene there. Or you will lose that hair. She'll be caught. Other ways they get caught is they get what they call chopped, which is when they put the hounds into a field, a field of crops, or a, you know, any big old field, sometimes the hares, it's full of hares, and they get up and they run in all directions, and one makes a mistake and goes straight into the jaws of the hounds. And there's not much you can do there. I mean, had an occasion last season where that happened down near Sutton Hoo, and uh, the hare had, had hidden in the field. Do you know that you can virtually stand on the hare before she'll get up and run? You can almost trip over her. Well, the hare was squatting down, the hounds came, she got up and ran, bang, straight into the hounds. And one of our young sabs there piled in and pulled the hare, the live hare, out of the dog's jaws to try and save her life. Pretty courageous act to take my gym. Um but he couldn't help her. She died in his arms. And the strange thing was, you know, that that hair, you'd think if it's been savaged by the dogs, it was going to have bleeding injuries. There'd be blood on the coat of the hair. But there was nothing. There was nothing. And I took the body away. She was warm in my hands. I took her away for post-mortem. And the interesting thing was that in post-mortem, the injuries, the the puncture wounds were below the surface of the skin. When the dogs had bitten through her coat, they'd broken arteries, blood vessels, under the skin. All the bleeding was internal. Her chest cavity was full of blood. She was choking on her own blood. And even though there was nothing visible from the outside, that's what killed her. So the sad one, you know, unbeknown to him at the time, whatever he did would not have saved her life. So sometimes you have to steer yourself 
for dealing with situations like that. But it doesn't often happen. The sad group I go with, the Norfolk and Suffolk sads, more often than not, they save lives. More often than not, they see a hare or a fox running and they pull the hounds off and the hounds go another way and you see the hare just slinking off into the distance later. And there's nothing more satisfying than giving of your time and your effort to save an animal's life like that. And uh, people come into animal welfare for all sorts of reasons and people say, well, I, you know, there's all sorts of things. Huh? issues that concern me. There's global issues. There's the destruction of the oceans. There's the destruction associated with factory farming. People are concerned about the fur trade, about vivisection. But if you're concerned about hunting and blood sports, there's no better way to give your time on a Saturday than to be out there in the front line protecting our wildlife because they need it. They need it more than ever. And of course, Sabs have many problems, not the least of which is the hunters. They don't want to like having their fun taken away from them. There's no, I can't stand here and say to you, they're going to appreciate your presence. They're going to thank you for helping them to stay legal, because they don't. You have to learn to look after your vehicles, because if you leave an unattended vehicle, they'll put the windscreen in, you'll find a rock slung through the side window. That's happened to my car. I can go away, walk down the track to take some pictures, of what the hunt was doing, I come back and the side window had been put in with a rock. You know, you get all sorts of hassle like that. The police, as I say, they advise the hunts how to get round the law, and they even advise hunting people how to deal with our side. You know, what they say to them is, and we, we, we know this, we've had police officers have said to hunt supporters, if you've got an ante out there with a video camera, and you want to do them over, don't just go up and punch them. What you have to do is you go up and say, don't you abuse me, don't you swear at my wife, I've seen what you're doing, and you've just turned the camera on now, but you didn't have the camera on when you were swearing at my wife, did you? And then you hit it. Because it's on the tape that, you know, he, he provoked it, the sad provoked it before the guy attacked him. It's on the rise, of course, but it justifies their violence. And, it, and it's an example of the sort of problems we're up against. But we can get around that. We can get around everything. Because we have the hidden video cameras, we have cameras in the cars, we have digital dashboard cameras that film front, back, side, everywhere. We film everything that happens. You know, because we just learn to look after ourselves and we look after each other. We protect each other. You know, I've done a lot of monitoring work looking for artificial earths, which is where hunts build homes for, art for foxes to live in and breed in. And on one occasion we were down looking at one because it had become a badger set. And with an artificial earth becoming a badger set, it suddenly gets a lot of protection under law. Well, we were staking this place out, waiting for the badgers to turn up, but the first thing to turn up was the game to the stock. A big old Alsatian had come bounding through the undergrowth, undergrowth to say hello to us. And the guy said, it's not an amusement, well you're trespassing. And we said, well I'm sorry, we'll leave. And uh, we did. And the next thing we know is, we get a complaint from the uh, hunting people. Oh, your investigators were abusive and threatening to our gamekeeper. I said, do you want to hear the tape? Do you want to hear the tape on the camera that's around my neck? It might have been pointing to the ground, but as soon as we had trouble, I flipped it on and it was recording the whole conversation. Do you want to hear who was threatening? You're very welcome to. Because it wasn't me. I wasn't threatening anyone. We were getting the abuse. We were getting the threats. And do you know what the next thing they did? Just to show you how petty these people are. These people who own tens of thousands of acres of our countryside. They were that petty that after that they said, All right then, Mr. Huskisson, what will issue you with a writ for alleging criminal damage to our grass? Because you walked on our grass and you caused criminal damage to it. That is how petty these people get. They own great swathes of our countryside. And they're that concerned that people like myself and others in this room are out there safeguarding our wildlife, protecting our wildlife. 
So we have issues to deal with, people to battle against. But as we've got right on our side, has clearly been established, you know, Parliament in its wisdom had debates, and they didn't just come up and say, oh, we're going to ban hunting. You know, this, we don't like hunting, we're going to ban it. They had a vote after vote after vote. They had the Lord Burns hunting inquiry, they investigated it, they checked this, they checked that, they checked anything and everything. They looked into every sort of aspect of hunting. And they said that that is a measure of cruelty too far. That should not be imposed on our wildlife simply for fun. And so you have a situation where the country as a whole says we don't want this, Parliament didn't want it, and yet it still continues. And it's a pretty sad state of affairs. But it will end one day. Because the savages are out there now are protecting our wildlife, and sooner or later, even the most dim-witted hunting person is going to dawn on them that they can have their fun. They can have a gallop over the fields. They can have their handwork. But all they have to do is to set the hounds against a man. And I've said to them many a time, I said, look, I'll run the drag for you. I will run the drag. I'll take it over those fields. And you will not know that you are not hunting live quarry. I mean, I've seen it so many times. They've got no idea what their hounds are hunting. You know, you can have a pack of fox hounds who go into a wood on one side and cry, and we're around the other side, and we see deer come out. Two deer come out with the hounds screaming after them. You film the deer running with the hounds behind them. These are fox hounds, remember. And when the riders come through, I say, you want to stop those hounds because they're rioting after deer. And they say, don't be effing stupid, mate. They're only after fox. They only ever hunt fox. And we've seen them hunting the deer. So if they don't know, if all they're after is a gallop after the hounds chasing something, then why in God's name should it still be a live animal? Why should it still be a live animal? We would run the drag lines for them and they would have all the fun without the cruelty. And that's what we see. And uh, as I said, I've been around in this business for quite a long while. I uh, did a book last year, if anyone wants to. Uh, Out Fox Take Two. It's, a, it's an accurate account of what fox hunting, stag hunting, hair coursing is about. Because I started as a hunt saboteur. I then realised that it was no point in me coming out and saying to people, hunting is cruel because this happens, hunting is cruel because that happens. Because hunt supporters would say, bloody lies! It's lies! He's telling lies! It doesn't happen at all! We can only prove it visually by photograph and later by video. So how do you get those sort of pictures? Well, you can't just turn up on a hunt with a camera and start photographing them. It was years of patient work, going undercover, learning how to be a hunt supporter. And it's easy, you know? You think, how do you become a hunt supporter? It's surely easy to become a hunt supporter. This is an ante. This is a hunt supporter. <laughs> now, you know, you've seen them. You've seen them at the Norfolk show. They like to become a hunt supporter just as a flat hat. A flat hat is your item of uniform to be a hunt supporter. And you just go and watch, you listen, you allow them to tell you about this, that, and goodness knows what, gain their trust, gain their confidence, and that's what I did for years in amongst some of the biggest hunts in the country. To gather the film and the proof as to what they really do. They perfected the corn fox house, which at the time in the early 90s was the biggest in the country because it was Prince Charles' favourite hunt. They just had a slight problem when they allowed me to be a bit too close to them when they dug a fox out of the grass, a young cub. And you know they always say to you, oh the fox is a pest. Look how they, look how they get in the hen house and they kill all the chickens. The fox is a nuisance, we've got to kill them. So they had a live cub in his hand, the terrier man. You'd think if it's that much of a pest, he might just kill it there and then. Not done, just shoot it. But no, he let it go. 
let it go, dropped it for the hounds to chase after and kill. And that broke their number one rule. Because it, once you've handled the fox like that, you should kill it, not let it go. And uh, the mistake they made was that I was the other side of the field, 80 yards away with the video camera. And a little bit of 8 millimeter videotape that ran for, what, three, four minutes, undid that one, gave them a real lot of hassle. And the film was shown as far afield as New Zealand and Australia on news bulletins because of Prince Charles's connection with the hunt. But it showed hunting as it really is. And uh, I spent a lot of time with the coursing clubs out here, the Swaffham Coursing Club, Kimberley and Wyndham Coursing Club, Newmarket Coursing Clubs, all the, all the ones. I spent a lot of time with them to see you know, how coursing really works. Because in my mind, if you want to ban someone's sport, which is what we want to do, you've got to understand it. You've got to really know what you're talking about. And that's what we set out to do. So if anyone wants to understand it, I've got a few copies of this here. They're $16.50, that's an expensive price for a book. But believe you me, it reflects the amount of photographs that are in there. There's about 200 pictures in each one. And there are pictures showing what hunting is really about. Um, and uh, we look abroad as well. We take a, you know, an interest in what happens not only in the UK, but stag hunting. Do you know you used to have a quaint old pastime here called hunting carted deer? Carted deer, now you can sit there and you think, what earth are you talking about there? Carted deer. Well, the uh, Norwich stag hounds, what they used to do, they used to hunt deer, but it was, they were semi-tamed deer. So they would let out of a box, chase them around, catch them, put them back in the box, and take them back to the kennels. And uh, they do the same in uh, the Republic of Ireland, the Ward Union stag hounds do that. But again, you know, we go over there to see what they do, to film what they do. But the only reason you don't have it in this country was a, a, a hunt saboteur from the old days. But she wouldn't have called herself a hunt saboteur because she was doing it before the hunt saboteur association even started. Well, first of all, Collie, Wayne Barter, and she just sat on the front of the Land Rover just down the road from it, down the abyss, um, protesting against the cruelty of stag hunting. And she did that often enough for them to get so embarrassed that they stopped doing it. So it was direct action that stopped it. You know, we're a movement that relies on people doing all sorts of things. It's important for people to write to their politicians. It's important for people to write to their newspapers. It's important for people to lobby and campaign and do Facebook posts and goodness knows what. But there's nothing to beat the person that's out there on the day between the hands and their quarry. And that is where hunt saboteurs come in. So if you don't already support them, please do. You've got an excellent group here. Not one of the best groups in the country in my mind. And they're supported by some good people as well. Got a wildlife photographer that goes out with the local stats and he's got a £10,000 worth of camera lens and he takes beautiful pictures of hares to remind people what it is that's the object of people's fun. That you don't, you, you want to see a hare in all her beauty. You want to see a hare living and free out there. Not a bloody rag that's just tossed to one side as an object of fun for some, from some hunt supporter. An object that they could, they could get their fun another way. Now, I, I've watched it on for long enough. I'm keen to have any, anyone got any questions? Anyone that asks me anything? You can ask me not only about hunt sabotage, any animal welfare issue you like. You want to ask me about vivisection factory farming, live exports, zoo circuses, or anything. You know, if anyone's got any, uh, anything they want to tackle me about, please do. <laughs> Do you, uh, do you do anything to do with factory farming and stuff like that? Factory farming? Um, factory farming. Oh, oh sorry. Like factory farming, like chickens and the hens. Yeah, the, the hens, yeah. Um, I haven't done a great deal. I mean, there, there are the big sites here. You know, we, we always lobby. I can never understand not so much with hens, but 
you know, we've got an intensive pig unit opposite where I live. You can come around great swathes of Norfolk and Suffolk, where there's pigs living in the open, in the arcs, in the open fields. Now, in my mind, it, you know, if you have a life, if you only get one go in life, why not have it out in the open, out in the open countryside, and not sort of shut up in the unit? Um, it, it shouldn't happen. It, you know, the way we treat farm animals is appalling. Um, I haven't done a great deal of work specifically on that. I, I did some stuff on the live exports, following the live exports through um, carriage into uh, near Europe. But uh, it, it, it is an issue, you know, you really, I believe that you tread a slight issue pan on this earth, that we all come to it with but one go at life, and just as treat others as you expect to be treated yourself. And hens are wonderful creatures. I mean, we, we at home, we have expatriate hens. We give them a home for the rest of their lives. And people don't believe it, but a hen, each hen is a character. Each, if, you, if you've got half a dozen hens in, in, in a small enclosure, in a paddock or whatever, you will see individual characteristics in those hens. And given freedom of choice and that, you see them having a dust bath on a day like this, and they, they deserve that life. But they don't get it. You know, so many, ten millions, don't get it, and uh, and they should. Any other? Yes, please. How do you think um, public opinion has changed over the years, especially um, before and after the ban? Um, public opinion, if it's measured in terms of sort of what the media, where the media line is, it really is quite interesting because. When I started in the 70s, the media liked to take poke fun at Huns, and they were keen to take the side of Savs, and it was sort of all these courageous young men and women out there sort of protecting animals from the brutal hunters and that. And the media really we felt to be quite supportive for so long. When it actually got towards a bang, the media certainly turned against us. It, 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 it like sort of pitched in with like the, who were the financial masters of the media? Who was the money behind the big media outlets? And we felt that they turned against us and that they sided almost entirely with the hunt. And uh, it, it, in some ways I used to think, well, it's because the media loved the conflict. They loved the fact that you know, it, there was a constant, every Boxing Day, there was a story between the hunt and the anti-hunt. It got so routine that the media, Sky News would phone up the League Against Cool Sports and say, well, where is your demonstration this Boxing Day? So we could send out a news crew to film it. And the Boxing Day conflict was something they really liked. So the thought that it was going to be taken away because hunting was bad and they were all going to pack up and go home, appalled them. And they turned against us. And I think you can see that in some of the sort of lengthy articles going in towards the hunting bag are really very hostile to our viewpoint, which was a real shame. After, of course, then it, it sort of goes back the other way. And I think when you have hunts now saying, oh, we need the hunting act repealed and that, the media aren't too sympathetic to that. You know, certainly, yes, yeah, some of the right viewpoints are, but by and large, the feeling is, well, you know, it, it, it is as, the, as it is. And you know, many of in the media know that the hunts can get on doing what they like anyway. You know? um, so it, it, it's, it's swung around, and it's never been a sort of constant thing. Public, public opinion, I think if you ask ordinary people, their gut instinct is they don't like cruelty. And that's what we've always found. You, know, you can see that when you go into schools and you talk to kids. They're, they're basically thinking, you know, I have to say, look, it's bullying. That's what it is, it's bullying. You know, if you like blood sports, if you like violence, well then get in a boxing ring and fight some of your own sides. You know, but why pitch in against, have a mob of people against one small animal? It's bullying, it's cowardice, it doesn't stand any kind of examination on any logical ground. You know, and we find that the kids just, you know, they, they're so sympathetic to that viewpoint. We always have hope for the next generation, which perhaps is why this room is crowded. Because, as I say, I mean, how many people were alive in 1971? <laughs> Put your hands out, anyone who's alive. <laughs> yeah, so the next generation has 
come on board. And I'm delighted. It, it gives me hope for the future. And you can inspire your kids. And, uh, you know, because we've only got one world, we, we can't ruin this one and then go to another planet somewhere. We've got to look after this one. And, uh, you know, the wildlife and the creatures that are out there, they depend on us, and we depend on them. Yes, sir. Oh, sorry. I was just going to ask, um, I mean, I know a lot of us have some of the sort of legal rights and everything pretty well, and um, I just wondered if there was ever, if, if uh, have the groups ever used like legal observers, you know, like the Green and Black Cross people train people up to be kind of independent of legal observers so that they can, they're kind of there, I mean, a lot of the time they're used on devils and things like that to make sure that it was taken away by the police and also rights and all that sort of thing, but I just wondered if that would be useful thing to have on the side, really? Just because of the, the independent factor and the fact that they could maybe, you know, wouldn't maybe not get picked on in the same way as hands up, so they have to tell us sort of little kindness things in general, but I just wonder if that be... It, it is a very good idea, the question of having sort of a legal observer out there, someone that's got an independent status to make sure that sort of things don't get out of hand. And, I mean, we got towards it at some point where, because you've got the different groups, you've got the hunt saboteurs that are right out the front, you've got the League Against Cool Sports that sort of monitor and bring the law changes in and all that. But they did work together for a time, and the League Against Cool Sports would have their monitors out with um, high-vis tabards, with League Against Cool Sports monitor and all that on it, and they'd have video cameras and they'd have radios and what have you. And the police would sort of trust them as being unbiased, if you like, reporters of what was happening out in the, out in the countryside. But it fell by the wayside. But I, I think it's a shame because I think that that's the sort of thing that we need. You know, I mean, I've, I've always said that we've got neighbourhood watch, we've got farm watch, we need countryside watch. We need people out there to, sort of, to monitor what's happening in the countryside. But you always will still need the hunt saboteurs because it, you know, at the end of the day, yes, we can all sort of protect each other's property, but when the burglar is there and he's ripping stuff out of your home and he's running off down the road with it, someone's got to try and tackle it. And it might be a citizen's arrest and it might end up in a bit sticky and unpleasant, but if we're in the room of doing that, and we have to be with wildlife, because if you don't do it, the animal's going to die. Yeah, so that's it. So it, it, it would be a, a, a good idea. And I certainly know the police have said to me that, look, you know, as well as having all these people out here trying to stop it, why don't you have sort of a legal observers? Well, maybe we need people with legal training. People say to me, well, what would you do? If you lived your life again, what would you do, Mike? And I say to people, well, it's honestness. If I had my life again, I would become a lawyer. I would go into law, I would study law. When I was a kid, law was such a boring thing. You had to learn Latin and sort of daft things like that. And it sounded so boring. But if you are a good lawyer, you could tie the opposition up in knots and you could protect our people with legal defences that would tie their opponents up in knots. And I would always say to youngsters, if you can't think of what to do and you've got any way of thinking that sort of leaning in that direction, Go into the law because good animal rights advocates could be a real bonus for our cause. And we haven't got enough, and it can make the difference. I mean, I, you know, I can tell you from personal experience the difference between having a good lawyer and a bad lawyer can take a year in science. You know, I mean, I had a year when I would have been banged up before I got a not guilty out of a court, a crown court. But a good lawyer got me out. And you know, it, it's important to have. Someone else had a question. I'm just going to say, Keith said the hunt get around anything. Um, what experience have you seen that have always been on the side of hunters? Yes. Um, in the 18th, the West Point Fox Hounds tried to get a harassment order in the South, spending 20 grand in the court, and they failed. Right. How are you get around such a kind of violence? Ah, well, that's an interesting one. Section 35, that my colleague here has raised in the back, Section 35 is, is, a, is, a, is a dispersal order. The, the police, the, the hunts, if they don't like hunt saboteurs there, they phone the police and they say, we've got hunt saboteurs. 
And the police turned up and they can issue with the Section 35 dispersal order. That means that you have to leave the area, and if you don't, they will arrest you and you can face all sorts of legal consequences. Now, on the face of it, that can be challenged in court. I understand it has been, and some of them have been rescinded after sort of a conflict, you know, taking it higher. But actually, on the day, they have to give it to a person. And what it tends to happen is that the hunts say, we've got stabs, we need the police. The police turn up, give these things out. But they didn't matter to the people that were there. So I'm saying to staff, well, you, if you've got sort of four cars, just put one in to start with and hold the other three back. The police will tell them out, give their section 35 to that person, and then the police go home. They hang around for a little bit to make sure that the stabs are gone, and then they go. And then we put in another car. And then we put in another car. And, you know, or, or you put people in that aren't known. I, I don't get Section 35, because I dress up like a hunt supporter. You know, I mean, it's, some of the hunters know me, but a lot of hunters don't still, still don't know who I am. You know, because I'm blowing the hunting hall, but I'm dressed as a hunt supporter. You know, I, I, I make sure there's no one around when I blow a hunting hall. And if a hunting supporter comes round and says, Here, yeah, where's who's got the horn? I said, yeah, I've just heard the huntsman, mate. I think he's over there somewhere. I, I'm sure he's somewhere near here. I've heard him. I think he must be over that wood there. You know, and, and so it suddenly becomes a cat and mouse game. And the Section 35s make it difficult for us. But I think if we change our sort of tactics, don't put everyone in at once, and uh, link in with radios, and uh, pull people out and drop people in, then the police will soon get forward and go home, and uh, they'll think of another way to give us grief. But, you know, we've got right on our side, and uh, we will carry on. Hasn't they got the more than one person present, though? So if you're on the road, you can't get the section of over five. Is that right? I don't know. Oh, so they can't do it to one person. So if we drop people in the individual, yeah. yeah. I've seen it all, it's actually has to do a mask. Right, right. So, I mean, <laughs> it really has, yes, please. Um, so, right, we'll come back to the uh, Section 35. You, they have, you have to hear them give it to you. And if they give it to you on a piece of paper, do not keep the piece of paper. Because they arrest you and it's in your bag, then, then you can get to right. it, right? So you, you have, they have to be able to prove that you know the section 35. Right. So, like, can can I make find a way that they can't you, like whether you dress up differently or whatever, and make it difficult for them, then you can't be able to do it like section 35. Right, thank you. Yes. The difficulty with uh, section 35 is the police can attach, um, I think it's section 50 of the Police Reform Act, which means that you have to give you details. So that is a way of using legal leads to then essentially accept that section 35 one side because they can basically just arrest you for refusing to cooperate with the police officer. And that's what they did in the way it's and the use of this. But no, I have got to No, but with the section 50 you can. It's, it's a really difficult one to judge. Yeah, it's definitely. Yeah. <laughs> they certainly are, which is a, it's a sad state of affairs, isn't it? And, and you know, I can remember, I mean, I was out with Hunts Undercover after the Hunting Act came in in 2004, and I know of one hunt that scrupulously obeyed the law. I didn't have the you know, they were really careful about obeying the law. And they hunted legally for a year after the ban came in. And then other hunts said, to them, the ones that you have, don't worry about that. The police ain't going to do nothing. You don't have to follow the law. You know, just carry on doing as you've done before. And that was such a shame. Because if the police had just been a little bit bolder and said, look, you know, you obey the law. If you don't like it, change it. But until it is changed, that's the law. You know it. We know it. And it's... It, it, it could have been done, but it, it was sad the way the police count out to these people that, you know, they just regard as pillars of society and therefore always right, which was just nonsense. They're going to have this constant hassle in and stuff, but this, I mean, just right, 
supporters signed a pledge saying they would not obey any hunting ban and that they would go to jail rather than obey any hunting ban. Now there's two things about that. One is it indicates the fact that they have contempt for the law. These people that profess to be so sort of proud and responsible and pillars of society, they have contempt for the law. It also shows how gutless they are. Because have we yet found a hunting supporter to go to jail? Every single time a Hunt supporter's appeared in court, he's come up with some mealy-mouthed excuse as to why he couldn't see this or he couldn't see that or it was an accident. Not one of them has had the balls to stand in court and say, yeah, I hunted illegally, what are you going to do about it? Go on, send me down, send me down. Give me a fine, I won't pay it. I won't pay it. I'm going to get a prison for supporting hunting because I'm a hunting martyr and I'm a hunting hero. <laughs> there wasn't a damn one of them. Not one of them had the guts. They all said they would. They all queued up to say, I'll be the first in prison and Clarissa Dixon right will be doing the food for me and goodness knows what other than Tosh. But when it come to it, they were as cowardly in court as they're cowardly in the hunting field. And uh, you know, there are people that I find it hard to have regard for, to be honest. You can't go to prison for breaking Well, they can have, they can have something imposing that they decline to do, refuse to do. They can end up with a fine they refuse to pay. They could have, uh, also, you know, I'm sure they could if they tried. <laughs> if they wanted to. Yes. I, I should say, I can't stand it, but I say that one of the, the best pictures of hunt sabotage ever to be come in front of my camera was just down the road from here in uh, Dunstan Harry's country uh, with a lad from the local south called Tim Nickerson, good guy, many years ago, and uh, I was out monitoring with a camera, he was out as a hunt sab, and the Dunstan Harry's came across the field with a hare running flat in front of them pressing her hard. She came past me and went down the road. I looked down the road and there was a car park. There was Tim Nicholson's car and he was stood by his car like this. And he let the hare go by the road, down the road, and as soon as she'd gone, he stepped out like that. <laughs> and uh, stopped the hounds. And they never went past him. 
the, the hair had gone and the hands were checked long enough to save her life. And I've got the sequence of pictures on uh, my camera. And that shows what hunt saboteurs are about. You will read all kinds of tosh in the right wing media. You'll see them about hunt sab just want to be out there for a punch up, want to not be off their horses and all this sort of stuff. It's all drill and nonsense. Hunt saboteurs are out there to save lives. The only people that are bad with her are hunt saboteurs. Two saboteurs have been killed. Neither, neither huntsman. So the only time in prison for killing two sacks. You know, they, 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 they've been killed, they've been badly injured, and it's a measure of our position. I mean, right back in the early 80s, there was a fellow called Eddie Coulson who went to watch the Waterloo Cup, a big hair crossing event, and he was just stood there watching it, and the secretary of a local forcing club, one down in Essex, ran up behind him. No word of argument, no word of excuse exchange, no nothing. He never said a word to him. He just smacked him in the head with the steel end of a shooting stick and caved his skull in. And uh, Eddie was nearly killed. He was in, on life support for days. And he suffered life-changing injuries that cost him his job, cost him his marriage. And the guy that did that to him was jailed for six months. And he only ever served a few months in jail in Norwich prison. And we were t tipped off that he, when he was coming out. And I watched him come out of Norwich Nick in the morning. And later that morning, he was down at Swaffham Corsic, well, Corsic again. And they were all glad hands and saying, Good old mate, good old boy, well done, mate. You showed that side, you showed him, you dealt with him, mate. And that's where the violence comes from. It comes from those who are violent to animals and violent towards those who protect them. So if you're out there in the fields, we need to protect each other, look after each other, and we do do. You find that the sabs are well used to taking care of each other, and uh, the more sabs there are, the less likelihood there is of violence. I always say, I put it on my Facebook post, if there's five hunters of 50 sabs, the hunters might get ridiculed and might get mocked, but they'll be safe. If there are five sabs and 50 hunters, those sabs will end up being carried from the field in an ambulance. And that is where the truth is. The violence comes from those who are violent to our neighbours. Yes, please. Yeah, um, like the on the oh, yeah, there's a, there's a, I don't know a great deal about this, but I think that, I mean, the driven grab shooting issue, it, it, it combines the cruelty of the uh, arse-down prejudice control and, and harm to the environment because I think the, the nature of grab shooting is it's likely to, you know, it's, it suggests that's what causes the floods in the um, sort of villages near there. So, I mean, all, all the shooting things are, are bound up in a, a lot of issues. You know, you have the, the actual cruelty of the shoot where there's an awful lot of wounding, and uh, you only have to go to any ship around right here and you see the Spaniels and the Labradors chasing around winged birds and coursing on the ground, if you like. You've got the cruelty involved in the ship, you've got the cruelty of the predator control and the sort of destruction of natural predators in order to preserve your grass, and then you've got environmental hazards. You know, sometimes in the EDP you see letters about all the plague of rats in Norfolk. Well, I can remember asking one of these, if one know there's a plague of rats in Norfolk, go and have a look in the woods. Because in the woods, the woods are full of pheasant fingers that scatter corn by the ton in the woods. And, you know, is it any wonder that you put out a load of food there and you get all sorts of things that you don't necessarily want? And furthermore, they kill the natural predators and rats. So, but, you know, we, we look at it as, it's a, it's a whole issue, it's, it's a broad issue, it encompasses many things, and one would look for a sort of a, a decent resolution for that. Yes, um, I was just wondering like, what you think the difference with um, selling uh, like, both a hunt farm here, but then also like, with selling legal things like the bad coal, like deer coal in London and I know the thing kind of boxes in Scotland, you know, where it's all completely legal, it's all free. Like what would be the difference of like stabbing something that's legal and then so like obviously 
You know the Japanese whaling excuse? They claim research as an excuse. They say that they're going out killing deer as part of their research studies. And they only ever use two hands as well, because the law said you could use two hands to flush a deer out to the open. So what they do is they have the hands in relays. They have a, you know, a land rover with half a dozen hands in, and you've got two out in the field, and then they just swap them over during the day. So that the hands, are, there's always fresh hands chasing the deer. You know, I mean, it's a devious way of getting around the law, but as you said about the hounds being killed, you know, I, I mean, I'm writing a book now, and I remember going down to a debate at Bristol Cathedral School, and the idiots from the Countryside Alliance, they said, oh, well, we'll stuff it, because we, they sent along the master of the mended fox hounds, uh, Alison Hawes from the Countryside Alliance, and a couple of hounds. And uh, so I was faced with these two hounds that were brought in, and it was a long life. Oh, look at this bloke, this ante, he was the band hunting, and all these hounds were killed. Hounds like this, lovely hounds like this. Look at them, kids, come and pack the hounds. Would you want these killed because hunting's bad? And of course, it gifted me the point to make out that no hound like this ever dies of old age. Hounds do not die of old age. They've died long before the end of their natural lives. They've died about six, seven seasons in the pack. And then they're killed by the hunt. And they kill thousands every year. A lot of hounds don't even make it to that age. A lot of hounds are killed as puppies because they're unsuitable for hunting. There used to be a pack of fox hounds called the black and tans, where all the hounds had to be black and tan. And any that were born with a fleck of white in them, they were killed as they couldn't be drafted. Furthermore, and perhaps the crucial thing is, I would say to the kids, look, those two hounds, you have charged them, you are responsible for their safety. Would you really, really want to get your fun by putting those hounds into mortal danger? Would you want, those hounds will chase anything you teach them to chase. Do you really want to be the ones that teach them? to hunt a fox or a hare that can go over a main road, over a railway line, where every year hounds are killed. Doesn't it say the hawks are gone? Well, there's only so much strain you can take on a dog, can take on a hawk, you know, man, you treat the same dogs to have a spanky dog, or if you eat and say, yeah, you can't do, you can't hare yeah, for more than, obviously we do wild and dark, but I'm trying to stop it. Um, but yeah, you can't do it more than, once every few months, it rips their hearts apart. There's I, so much adrenaline and so much. I've never heard of fox hounds, but you're right with hair coursing. I mean, when the hair coursing clubs used to go with, they would say that sometimes <coughs> the hair coursing would continue with the greyhounds labouring after the hair, long after it got off the coursing field. They'd be able to head them far away with the greyhounds chasing it. And sometimes the greyhounds would die from the overexertion. And uh, they would die that night. Or, or, you know, within a day they would die from their overactivity. Yeah, the dogs don't stop when it's not to stop. They would just No. Yeah. I haven't, to be honest, I've never heard of it in fox hands, but I've seen it. I don't, yeah, I don't know either. Yeah. Yeah. I'm, not, I'm not sure about, um, you know, the actual heart muscle, but there was a video that a certain sad group put up um, where. Uh, similar to a scenario with the Waverly Harriers on, on Wednesday night, um, where the pack of hounds were in check for most of the day because they didn't expect us to be there, so they didn't really know what to do. And at the end of the day, the two deer came out of the little woods, and the hounds completely rioted. And with, with a build up of excitement like that, hounds were just not listening to anyone, not even a huntsman. You know, so they completely just went wild. And there was a video um, that another sound group got of a similar scenario. I think they were a fox, a fox pack, and they completely rioted for so for so long. I think it was like over an hour. And a couple of the hounds actually had fits in someone's garden, and it was uh, the actual sounds who tended to those hounds because the huntsman was still, you know, blowing them on. Yeah. So I think. Well, they must lose hounds and leave them in their experience. Oh, yeah, definitely, like, Easton Harris. I had a conversation with a police on the loss who was dispersing um, some of us, and uh, there was about two hounds going about two miles one way, and the hunt was about two miles the other way, and the hounds running it over. Mm. 
in the sense of the Copa Lo Boy, it's a bigger danger right now. Me standing here with those two dogs running across A roads. Yeah. It's like the kind of railway tracks in the summer days when the train was coming in. But that's one thing with being a stab out there. You can, many's the time that you'll end up catching hold of the hands and have to put them in your car and take them back to the pack for their safety and well being. And you find yourselves out there as well at stopping the traffic because the hands are crossing the road and the cars are winding around there and you have to stop the traffic. And, you know, I mean, the hands don't have it. You know, they say, oh, you just want to see the hands killed. No, we don't. We don't want to see any hands killed. We don't see anyone hurt in the field. And we will get measures to protect them. Um, I've got a few copies. I run a small group that I've called Investigation Group. You'll find us on Facebook and on the internet. A few copies of our magazine we put out one twice a year. Anyone wants to take a copy of that, they're very welcome to. Um, I don't know, I was built to speak here for a bit of a shop by Copper Nair. Anyone ask me any questions? I think it's practical, like, what have you got techniques that if you are being stopped by the police, what are you doing? Is it going to be hard? I mean, with the police, we're always a, we always apologise for anything we might have done wrong. And, uh, <laughs> If you're trying to stop an illegal hunt, like, what do you say to them? Well, we charge the police officers the video. We say, look, I mean, that hunt in the hair. You can see that hound hunt in the hair. And show the police officers so that you, If you're trying to stop an illegal one, that one that is allowed, that's very much Oh, right, but... Well, I mean, the people that post the badger have all sorts of tactics and they're doing that. You know, you, you can be standing on the foot of the path legally. You shine a bright torch into a shooter's eyes legally. There's so many tactics you can use to get around it, lawfully. I mean, how was only a man for 10 years, sadly, than us. All them years, we sat the huts. I remember when I that big piece of steel, I don't know. They were the evil. What we were doing, I mean, I sat for 12, 13 years. Never got the best of us. And how did you manage that? What the biggest thing you look at is the well, um, in regards to the, the whole like legality of um, certain situations, for example, like the badger call, um, I was down in the Somerset coal zone just outside of Taunton. And on my first night, we actually came across um, a shooter. Um, and I think he was free shooting. Um, and technically, what he was doing was legal. But because of the difficulty and the tension related to what was going on, the police didn't arrest us or anything. They actually, uh, the, the funny thing about that scenario was that the person who was shooting didn't even put his rifle away properly and was escorted by the police to get away from us. Right. Um, so it, it really is subjective to the um, scenario really because you know we've, we've had we've had examples where like we've got perfect evidence of illegal hunting, the police turn up and they just don't want to hear about it. We've shown them the footage, they just don't care. On, on the last meet of the Waveney Harry's last season this year, um, we were told by a police officer to call the non-emergency police number 101 to report an eagle uh, hunting by an officer who was there. He told us to call the police, and he was a police officer. <laughs> you know, like you can't make that up. <laughs> so it really depends, doesn't it? I think, as you said, the guardian shooting as well, it's a different dimension there when you've got people with guns and when you have saboteurs out on, on shoots, you tend to find that the shooters, they will put the guns away and depart without too much argument because um, I think they're just losing their license if they do anything but vaguely threatening and intimidating with the shotgun. It's a, it's a different dimension. If it's the case that some parts of the hunts that were done at night, people would go out and talk about being no whistles and they could even hunt with people in the area. Yeah, yeah. Uh, that's, 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 that's,
This week you heard Blue Eyed Bitter by A Rock. Right now you're listening to Green Grass of Tunnel by Mum. You know how every week we're saying, hey, please go rate and review us? Well, I just wanted to give a shout out to Andy Ma for actually going and rating and reviewing us on iTunes. They stated, You all are great. I love the variety of people spoken to and the willingness to criticize as well as praise all the work being done out there. Keep it up. How do you keep it up? Let's let's both keep on keeping on, right? Yeah, keep rating and reviewing us. That's right. Mm-hmm. Doing a good job. So, uh... <laughs> So thank you so much, Andy Ma. Uh, it helps out the show tremend- tremendously to go rate and review us. So uh, go do that if you have a free second. You can find us on iTunes, Stitcher, Google Play, iHeartRadio, or YouTube. And YouTube. That's right. We're on YouTube now. And many other podcast aggregators. So check us out. Rate us on whatever ones allow it. <laughs> if you're not yet our friend, you should also be our friend on social media. We have all of them. Not really. There's so many now. But the ones that you know about. Mostly. So be our friend. We often say things on social media that we don't say on the show. And by often, that's pretty much every day. Fuck shit down. Which Side Podcast is hosted and produced by Jordan Halliday and Jeremy Parkin of the Which Side Media Collective, with web design by Jordan Halliday and sound design by Jeremy Parkin. Booking by Mari Halliday. Theme music by Commandantes. Go to wishsidecollective.org to check out the other shows in the collective. As always, fuck shit damn. <laughs>